What you just witnessed was done on an unmodified copy of Pokemon Ruby, with no glitches or hacks. Well, no hacks on the copy of Pokemon Ruby, anyway. All of this was done using the often forgotten Nintendo Game Boy Advance peripheral known as the Nintendo e-reader, and the Eon ticket. No, not the in-game item, the physical card. I don't have a real one. Before downloadable content, developers had to get creative if they wanted to add extra content to an already released video game, and the e-reader was one of those techniques. It's a GBA cartridge with an infrared scanner in it, and you use that to scan special trading cards with dot codes on them to gain access to small programs. In Pokemon's case, this was used to add content to almost every single Gen 3 game. You can use it to add new trainers to Moss Deep City, add unique berries, or unlock custom events. That last thing is what we're interested in here. Ruby and Sapphire have one custom event, the aforementioned Eon Ticket, but the other Gen 3 games have four different event locations that you can go to via the mystery gift feature. So I got to thinking, wouldn't it be cool if Ruby and Sapphire had access to all of these custom events that Fire, Red, and Leaf Green and Emerald had? But that's impossible, right? Well, as it turns out, Ruby and Sapphire's mystery event feature is far more flexible than the mystery gift feature featured in Pokemon Emerald and Fire Red and Leaf Green. So let's analyze how the Eon ticket works and see what we can do to mess with it. I'll be using the code from Pokecard E, a disassembly project on GitHub from Hatchkey and Packy. The first thing the Eon ticket does is set which object will execute the script that we make when we interact with said object. The first two numbers are what map and map bank said object is on, and the last number is what person event it is. And I can get all that info from the ROM hacking program called Advanced Map. And as it turns out, a person event is not just persons as you would expect it would be. It can be anything from NPCs, to cut trees, to rock smash rocks, to strength boulders, to invisible Kecleons and the Voltorbs on the ground, and even items that you can pick up off the floor as long as they're visible. These are all person events, which we could assign our script to. In Fire Red, Leaf Green, and Emerald, the mystery gift and event functions are hard-coded to only work with the delivery man in the Poke Centers. So what we could do there is a lot less interesting and a lot less flexible than what's available in Ruby and Sapphire, where the world is literally our oyster. After the Eon Ticket sets its person event, it then defines the location for two different scripts in RAM, the Preload script and the Norman script. The Preload script only runs while you're at the mystery event loading screen, and it does some checks to see if you've played the mystery event for the Eon Ticket before and if you have, it deletes itself. This is all written in Gen 3's proprietary scripting language, which is uh, quite limited. As you can see here, there's really not a lot of commands, but it's what every scripted event in the Gen 3 games is written in, so it will have to do. Or will it? Okay, so how does the Eon Ticket get this information to the GBA game? Well, it does a transfer routine that sends the script to a location in the game's RAM called, well, RAM script. This is a 995 block of data starting at 2028 DCC in RAM, and it ends at 20291 AF. I keep talking about bytes and RAM, but what are these things? Well, think of the games of Ruby and Sapphire as a mall, and all of the in-game data and functions as stores that you can go to within said mall. A RAM location like 2028 DCC is just the number on the directory that tells you where the store is. A byte is a measurement of size. Think of it like the amount of square feet a store would take up in the mall. Now to give you some perspective on how little space we have to work with here, the entirety of Ruby and Sapphire is 16,512 kilobytes, if you include both the save file and the ROM itself. 1,000 bytes go into a kilobyte, so we have roughly 0.007% of the game's total storage space to write the scripts that I want to write into the game. So after the transfer is complete, the game runs the preload script, and if you pass that, then when you talk to Norman, he will run whatever is located at RAM script. His script is also very simple. It just checks if you've got the Eon ticket in either your PC or in your bag. And then it also checks if you've ever battled the Lati at Southern Island. And if you pass all of those checks, he will play some dialogue and give you the Eon ticket. So the first change I tried to make was very simple. I wanted to see if I could change the NPC effectively. And so I made it some random NPC at the Moss Deep Space Center since I wanted to do a Deoxys event, and my first hope was to get something going there. It worked, so now it's time to start programming. At this point, I think it's worth mentioning that all of this was inspired by the work of a person called Militia. You see, my friend Cow sent me an entire set of the physical battle e-cards, and while looking for interesting things to do with them, I stumbled across her videos. She actually made a custom Deoxys event years ago, and she did it in Meteor Falls. So I thought the first thing I would do was try and recreate that event. It was actually extremely simple to get going. I just used the set wild battle command to put a full Deoxys in enemy ramp. Then I check if the player has room for a moonstone in their back. 
And if they do, I use call standard function one to delete the Pokeball on the floor and give them a Moonstone. I set some visual flourishes with text boxes and the special commands, which let me play effects like earthquakes or flashes. And then I use the do wild battle command, which actually starts the battle. And bam, a level 30 wild Deoxys. This is really cool. Or that's what I thought at first. But this is when I realized that this project is going to take a lot more work than I first thought to get an actually usable end product. Why? One. Deoxys and Mew require a specific flag set if they are to obey the player in any Gen 3 game that isn't Ruby and Sapphire. This is known as the Event Legal Flag, sometimes called the Obedience Flag or the Faithful Encounter Flag. So if this Deoxys was traded to Emerald, it wouldn't obey any orders at all. 2. This Pokémon does not look legal at all if I drag and drop it into PK Hex, and I bet you it would not transfer to the newer games via Bank and Home. 3. I use the Dragon Claw TM for this, to start the event. What if the player already picked that item up? 4. What if they didn't pick it up? Does the player just now miss out on the Dragon Claw TM? That doesn't seem very fair. Well, it's time to problem solve, which in my experience this whole programming really is. What I decided to do about the Dragon Claw TM situation was use the preload script to clear the flag for it. So if the player had already picked it up, when they load this event, the item will be respawned into that spot. And if they hadn't picked it up yet, it won't do anything. So I can guarantee the item will always be there to start my event script. This doesn't fix the problem where if the player hasn't picked up the Dragon Claw TM yet, they now lose it because it turns into a Moonstone. So what I decided to have was that the Pokémon would be holding the item that was on the ground formerly if it was a rare item, like Dragon Claw. I think that having the Moonstone there makes it feel more custom and interesting, but I didn't think it was fair to have the player permanently lose out on an important item. So I think that's a pretty good compromise. At this point, I also went ahead and added some text to the preload script, which gives a little bit of story flavor as to why Deoxys would be in Hoenn. As for legality, that's a much bigger issue, and one I was only able to tackle with the help of my friends Riley and Xiao, and the most powerful command in the entirety of the Gen 3 scripting language. Call ASM. This script command lets you jump to any place in RAM or ROM, and begins executing whatever is there as code. But not the easy scripting code we've been using thus far. No. GBA assembly code. Assembly is the closest you can get to speaking directly to the GBA's computer chip. The GBA has two different modes of operation, ARM and thumb, and thus two different assembly languages that you can write in. And they're, uh, <laughs> hard. This is why I turned to Xiao and Riley for help. They both have a pretty extensive history of programming and assembly in the GBA to make ACE codes for the Gen 3 games. Although those were written in ARM assembly, whereas I chose to write this program in thumb assembly. Suffice it to say, I had my work cut out for me here. I can barely program something usable in C++ or JavaScript, and I went to school for baking, not computer science. But nevertheless, I was determined to try. Xiao very quickly came up with the idea to call the in-game function known as setBoxMonData, using call ASM. This function lets you change one thing about a Pokémon at a time, and it has three arguments to it. One is, where is the Pokémon in RAM? Two is, what do you want to change about that Pokémon? And three, what is the value that you want to put in the spot that you're going to be changing? After a lot of debugging to figure out what went where, we had our first program. Behold, it's beauty, it's majesty, and wait, how am I even going to get this custom code into the GBA? The only way I could see to write custom data into my script was using the write byte to address function, which at the cost of six bytes lets you write one byte of data to a specific location. Hardly efficient. But that's when Riley had a realization. You see, everything in the scripting language is actually just a macro. But when you look at what the macros are doing, all they do is define a byte of data and then maybe leave room for a variable or two afterwards. So what we did was make our own custom macros where all we do is set bytes of data in a long chain after converting our assembly code into hexadecimal data. And as long as we put these functions in places the scripting language never goes, they'll never be read as scripts. But when we jump to them with call ASM, they'll be read as the thumb assembly code that they truly are. Let's go over how this program works because it's actually really simple. Setbox mon data gets the arguments it needs directly from the GBA CPU. In thumb mode, the CPU has eight spots, known as registers, that it can read and write from. What I do is write register zero with the location of Deoxys. I get this data into the register by having it at the end of my program. And I say load whatever value is at our current location plus 12 into register zero. So it looks at where we are in RAM, adds 12 to it, and then loads whatever is at that location into register zero. I repeat this with register one, which has a four F in it. That's the identifier to the location of the obedience flag in a Pokemon structure. After that, we do it again with register 2, but that has a location of the data we want to set the obedience flag to, which is in this case 10. 
Lastly, I load register three with the location of set box mon data, and then I jump to whatever is at register three. Set box mon data does its thing, and then instead of returning to my custom ASM, it actually returns to the scripting language. And then the script continues as normal. Now, Deoxys needs two other things changed about it. It's game origin and it's met location. Both of those need to be Emerald and Birth Island, respectively. Although, Fire Red and Leaf Green would work too, I guess. The nice thing about this code is that I can actually just very easily reuse it for both of those things. All I have to do is change what's in register 1 and register 2. And bam! We add those to our code and we have a fully legal Deoxys. Its summary screen will look a little bit weird in Ruby and Sapphire directly after you catch it. But if you take a peek in PK Hex or in Emerald version, you can see that Deoxys is fully legal. It's got the game origin and met location in Emerald version, and it has the obedience flag set. At this point, I only had to do a few more things to get this event to look pretty legit. On the Eon ticket itself, I changed the text to say, sending Deoxys event instead of sending the Eon ticket. And I also changed the picture from the Eon ticket to a front sprite of the Deoxys. I got the sprite and the palette for the Deoxys from Poke Emerald. Thank you, Riley. And uh, I changed the dimensions of the picture in the Eon ticket. And I also had to change the include for the palette to ink bin. This is a whole process and really frustrating, but I'm glad we figured it out because I think the end result was really nice. Really, all that's left to do is make the five other unique Emerald events that I want to add into this game. But all the card assembly stuff is done, and that's really copy-pastable. So I really just had to pick locations for the Pokémon and add custom text and visual flourishes. So with that said, let's showcase the events. For Mew, I chose Route 120, since it was reminiscent of Faraway Island with all the tall grass and whatnot. I also used an invisible Kecleon block as the trigger for the event to reference Mew's Pokedex entry as a Mirage. Mew is also holding a Starfairy here, another Mirage reference, and the item that Kecleon becomes is a Lumberry, because while Mew supposedly has a 100% chance to hold that item. In addition, while I thought about and toyed with making Mew Japanese, since that's the only legal one, I ultimately decided it was fine to leave it in English. The main reason for this was that if your trainer name or nickname for Mew was outside of the five character limit of a Japanese Mew, it had become illegal, since that's not possible on Japanese games. Besides, all language Mews pass through Pokemon Bank and Home anyway. I did include code to change it to Japanese, so if you want to do that, just follow the instructions on my code and feel free to try it for a more authentic Mew. With Lugia, I made the setting the Abandoned Ship referencing its future location in Pokemon Omega Ruby. The item on the floor is Calm Mind, representative of Lugia trying to contain its power, and it's holding a Water Stone, which was the original item from that location. For Ho-Oh, I chose Mount Pyre as the location, as Ho-Oh in its native mythology is said to be able to revive the dead. I made an item on the ground a Sacred Ash, and its hold item a Bright Powder. The item on the ground was originally a full heal or something, so I decided when the item was not of importance, I'd make the held item a rare item only obtainable from the Battle Frontier or the Tower, or something like that, just as a reward for playing the event. And that's all the event Pokemon from Emerald version done. But I also thought it would be cool to allow the player to catch the version exclusive legendary from the other game using these cards as well. So Ruby could catch Kyogre and Sapphire could catch Groudon. The only difference between these two events and the other ones in terms of their code is that they don't need the event legal flag set. So I removed that piece of code from my assembly. In addition, they're the only events that I locked to the post game. Every other event that I've made so far can actually be done the moment you unlock Mystery Event, which is just after defeating Norman. But I didn't want Kyogre and Groudon outshining each other in their own games, so it's post-game only. For Groudon, I really, really wanted to put its encounter on Mount Chimney, but there was not a single suitable item or interactable there. The Meteorite container was unfortunately considered a signpost, which I cannot set as an event flag. So I moved it a bit south to the Jagged Pass. The item it's holding is the Soft Sand. Kyogre I am quite proud of. 
It's underwater where the Submarine Explorer 1 is. I had to re-enable several story flags using the preload script to make it reappear, but they go away the moment you do the event. I think it's worth it for the cool visual of having the submarine back. Did anyone else have that rumor in their school where you could take the submarine and go to Johto to get the Johto starters there? Just me? I don't know. Kyogre is holding the scope lens. I would have done the Mystic Water, but everyone gets that item from cast form during their playthrough, so I just picked a random rare item. And that's every unique Emerald event brought to Ruby and Sapphire. I was quite proud of this, but I wanted to do one more event, something to really make this set of cards special. Part five, Ageto Celebi. Celebi is probably one of the toughest Pokémon for players to get if they're playing legitimately in Gen 3, and they're not from Japan. The English event for this was not preserved, and even if it was, you would still need a flashcard or something to access it. Although if you do want this event, my friends Gopier and Undead Reality have successfully made a recreation of it and every other Gen 3 distribution. So if you're interested in that type of thing, go check out their video on it. But what this means is the only way you could get a 100% legal Celebi today is uh, accessing the Japanese bonus disc. In order to do this, you need a Japanese copy of Pokemon Coliseum that has all the Shadow Pokemon purified, a copy of the bonus disc, a Japanese copy of a GBA game that has gone past the Hall of Fame, and the most important thing is a GameCube that could play Japanese GameCube games. This is a lot of investment, both with your money and your time. So I got it into my head that I could recreate this event within Ruby and Sapphire themselves. And as a bonus, I really, really wanted this event to be battleable. This is because outside of the Virtual Console Celebi event, you've actually never been able to battle Celebi to capture it, and I thought that would be really unique and really cool. But making this event would actually be significantly more difficult than anything I had done thus far. This was because my other program was just me setting up the registers as needed and then yelling at the game saying, Hey, do setbox mon data! And it goes, yeah, right. But here, I'll be able to use almost no in-game functions. You see, the Ageto Celebi has a lot of set data. In fact, the only things that are random about it are the personality value of the Pokémon, the PID, and the IVs. Everything else is entirely static. This means if I wanted to make Celebi legal, I would have had to call setbox mon data like 12 times or something. And really, that would have meant space would be quite a concern here. So to resolve this, Xiao came up with the idea of storing a temporary Celebi in RAM. Since all this info is static, I just took a legal Ageto Celebi that I had, decrypted it, and then zeroed out the IVs and the PID. And I used the same method we used to store our programs to store an entire Pokemon. Then once everything is stored, we can just copy it directly into enemy RAM. With Celebi set up this way, we actually won't need to call setbox mon data at all. Uh, so for the IVs and PID, we can just call the game's normal RNG function and use that to fill out the PID and IVs, right? Wrong. You see, Pokemon Coliseum actually uses a different RNG algorithm than Ruby and Sapphire use to determine how a Pokemon is built. This means that if I want to use it, I need to program it in myself. So what the GBA games do is they take the RNG state from a location in RAM and they multiply a number to it, which is 41C64E6D. Then it adds 673 to that number. After that, it stores the upper four digits of that number somewhere, and then it repeats the math and stores the upper four digits again. Then it combines those two things, and that forms a Pokémon's PID. After that, it does it two more times for the Pokémon's IVs, with each RNG advancement effectively storing three IVs of the Pokémon. As for the GameCube methodology, luckily they both use 32-bit PRNG states, ranging from 0 to FFFFF, FFFFF. So I can use the GBA's current position as the starting point for my Kahlo RNG algorithm. Uh, so after I have the RNG state loaded, the game does a multiplication and addition, but the numbers are different. For Kahlo, you multiply 343FD, and you add 269EC3. After that, it does the same storage technique, where it pulls the upper four digits of the hex number, but it's for the Pokémon's IVs first. Then it does an RNG advance just to determine the Pokémon's ability. And lastly, it does the Pokémon's PID RNG in two advancements. So the addition and multiplication numbers are different, the order of generation is different, and there's an extra RNG call in there for the ability. In addition to that, a Ghetto Celebi is shiny locked, so I will have to incorporate that as well. So here is the RNG algorithm I ended up programming in. Let's take a look at how it works. First, I load the PRNG state into my program. And after that, I do the first RNG advancement, which is the multiplication and then addition, and I temporarily store the IVs in a register. Following that is the second advance, where I store the lower three IVs in a different register. 
Then I combine all six IVs together and I store them in the IV location of this temporary Celebi. After that, I do an RNG call for the ability, but I don't store anything. This is because if a Pokemon in Gen 3 only has one ability, like Celebi does with Natural Cure, even if the RNG call or PID says it should have a different ability, it just hard codes it to be ability zero. So it makes my temp Celebi's ability always valid. Okay, onto the PID and Shiny Lock. But before that, let's talk about how shininess works in these games so you can understand how I'm doing the lock. So to determine if a Pokemon will shine, the game performs a bitwise exclusive or between the PID and TID and SID of a Pokemon. And if that operation results in any number from 0 to 7, it'll be shiny. So what I do is I generate the PID upper and lower using the same RNG calls, and then I load Celebi's trainer ID into one of the registers. I do the exclusive OR and check if the result is 7 or below. If it is, I discard the PID and loop the program back around until I find a new one. And that check repeats infinitely until it finds a Celebi that wouldn't shine. But why would I do this? Why am I implementing a shiny lock to my fake made up event? Well, don't worry, I've actually made two. One where Celebi can shine and one where it can't. In the one where it can shine, I've just replaced the jump instruction, which would cause the loop to happen if the compare function was seven or below to a no op. So even if it is seven or below, it just continues on like normal and stores the shiny PID. But let's talk about why I've done this. So I really like RNG manipulation. It's one of my main hobbies and ways to interact with this franchise. And one of the reasons for that is to get really good, unique RNG legal Pokemon. But if I delete the shiny check, it actually deletes some RNG legal Pokemon. Allow me to explain. So the way the Celebi is generated is IVs, then Nobility, and then PID. And if it hits the shiny lock, it only discards the PID. It does not discard the IVs. This means that you can get unique nature and IV combos by aiming intentionally for Celebi shiny spreads, where you will get the shiny Celebi's IVs, but the nature of the next Celebi that wouldn't be shiny. To me, it didn't feel right to unilaterally delete these spreads for players like me who would get enjoyment out of hitting these Celebes. But I also know that there's many shiny hunters who would like to enjoy this event. So I thought that making two separate ones would be a good compromise so everyone could equally enjoy this event that I've made. I hope you agree with that as well. So you think at this point we could just take our current Celebi, transfer it entirely to enemy RAM, and then encrypt it, and we'd be ready to go, right? No, no, we can't do that. Why? You see, the order the four encrypted substructures of a Pokemon are stored is based on that Pokemon's PID. And because we've changed our Celebi's PID, we have most likely changed the order of these substructures, and all the data is going to be read wrong, sort of like a Pomeg corruption. So, how do we fix this? Well, it's time to learn about Pokemon data substructures and Pokemon encryption. So, the way a Pokemon is stored in RAM is as follows. A Pokemon's PID, then their full trainer ID, name, language, if they're an egg or not, the trainer name, marking data, the checksum, and then two empty bytes that are always zero. And then after all of this is the four 12-byte substructures that are encrypted and contain various info about the Pokemon. G stores the growth aspect, which is species, experience, held item, and a few other things. A is what attacks the Pokemon has and how many times a PP up has been used on said attacks. E is the EVs and condition, which stores, well, all of the EVs and the contest conditions. M is miscellaneous, which contains met location, game origin, IVs, ability, and the obedience flag. The order in which these substructures are stored is determined by the remainder of a Pokemon's PID divided by 24. The way we handled this was by crafting lookup tables for each of the substructures. This was so that when we copied the Celebi into enemy RAM, we can check where each of the substructures need to be copied to relative to the end of the unencrypted data. And you guessed it, the way we inserted these tables was the exact same way we inserted the Tem Celebi using fake macros. <laughs> With Celebi's data filled out, I send the entire unencrypted portion to enemy RAM using a memory copy BIOS function that's built into the Game Boy Advanced. After that, I do a mem copy for the encrypted sections dealing with the jumbled around PID. Okay, so we're almost done here, but the Celebi's checksum is now incorrect because we've changed the IVs. The checksum is just a simple addition of all of the half words in the encrypted sections, and the only thing I changed about the encrypted sections was the IVs. So I just have to add their values to the checksum. Now with the checksum done, we have to encrypt the Celebi. The Celebi has been unencrypted the entire time. So we just called the in-game function encrypt boxmon in order to do that. And all we have to do is put the location of Celebi into R0, which is enemy RAM. So the last thing I need to do is call calc boxmon stats. This is because we've been working with a boxmon the entire time uh, to save space. Pokemon are only stored in 80 bytes when they're in the PC, and when you look at them or withdraw them or something like that, it quickly calculates the stats for it. Uh, and I have to do this because the stats are not just its battle stats, but they're also the level and HP and everything like that. 
So if I don't do this, Celebi will show up at level zero. And we've also been working with a boxmon the entire time because we knew we'd be able to just call this function at the end of the whole process. So once that's done, we've got a fully legal Celebi with an enemy RAM. And we could even battle it. We can verify that it's fully legal by copying the bytes of data out of the GBA's RAM watch in MGBA and pasting it into a program like PokeGlitzer or PKHex. Why do I have to do it this way? Well, because once we catch it, uh, the Celebi turns into a bad egg. Yeah. So why does this happen? Well, catching a Pokemon actually overwrites a few pieces of its data. The trainer ID, the trainer name, the player gender, and the Pokeball are all overwritten on capture. And the trainer ID is actually part of the encryption key used to decrypt the Pokemon substructures. Because that's changed from what it used to be, the decryption fails and the Pokemon becomes a bad egg. So how do we deal with this? Well, my solution for this was a bit uh, hacky, but I think it worked out all right. So if I want to properly put this Celebi in your save, I need to know where it's going. And if it goes to a box, it's gone. I don't know where it is. But if it goes to your party, I can actually figure that out. And I do all of this within the scripting language. So the first thing I do is lock the player out of the event if they have more than five Pokemon in their party. I do this using the count Pokemon script command. It checks twice, once during the preload script and once when you talk to the Celebi, so you can't get around this check. After that, I store the amount of party Pokemon into one of the predefined variable locations. From there, once the battle ends, I do the count Pokemon function again, and I compare the number from this count Pokemon to the previous one that I have saved. If the new number is not bigger, I send you to a part of the script that narrates Celebi running away. If it is bigger, that means you caught the Celebi. But the Celebi is a bad egg now if you look at it. So what I did was, after Celebi is stored into enemy RAM, but before the battle starts, I recopy the finished encrypted Celebi from enemy RAM back over my temp Celebi within script RAM. Then, after the bad egg is in your party, I use the number in the new count Pokemon to see what party slot it went into, and I copy the Celebi from script RAM over it, which just deletes the bad egg entirely. A nice bonus about this is that since I only copy the boxmon portion of the Celebi and the bad egg stuff doesn't touch the calculated stats, Celebi shows up with the proper HP values and such from the battle, so I don't have to worry about those last 20 bytes at all. Unfortunately, my solution does cause some differences in how a normal capture works to how this one works, so allow me to explain the differences for you so you understand what you're getting into when you do this event. First of all, the Pokeball for a Ghetto Celebi has to be a Pokeball in order to be legal, so no matter what you catch it in, post-battle, it's going to be in a Pokeball. This means no ball matching for you if that's something you really enjoy. Can't do it. Up next was the trainer gender. This is something that gets overwritten on capture as well, typically, but a Ghetto Celebi always has a female trainer gender, so that's what it's going to be. You won't get the nice blue name that a male trainer name gets you if you like that. Up next is the remaining PP of the moves. Even if Celebi runs out of all its PP in battle, when you catch it, it's going to be restored. This is because I copy Celebi from enemy RAM into script RAM before the battle starts, not after it. This is for a reason I don't want to get into right now, but that means the PP will be restored. Unfortunately, this causes the nickname to also not get stored properly. So even if you nickname it post-battle, it will not keep the nickname. If you want to do that, you need the Ageto trainer name and trainer ID on your profile. Shiny Hunters, if you want a nickname, maybe try out your first RNG with an Ageto Celebi trainer ID RNG. I would suggest Coliseum. It's the most flexible game to get a custom trainer ID, or you could do arbitrary code execution in Emerald to change your trainer ID and secret ID and name for that. I may come back and fix the PP and uh, nickname issues later on. I know for sure I'm not done with the e-reader, but I just wanted this project to be finished now, and I consider all these deviations totally acceptable um, insofar as um, a custom event goes. In addition, even if I fix the name and the uh, PP issue, I'm never going to fix the trainer gender and the Pokeball issue. Those are always going to be Pokeball and female because um, I don't want players to have to catch a Celebi in a Pokeball for this event to work out. That would be a huge pain because uh, otherwise it wouldn't be legal. So uh, that's where I'm at with that. I hope you find the deviations acceptable as well. And that's it. A fully legal Ageto Celebi event programmed into Ruby and Sapphire. I am massively simplifying things here. This took days and days of debugging and coding and was a huge effort. I have to give a big thanks to Riley and Xiao for being extremely patient with all of my incessant questions. I could not have done it without either of them, so thank them as well. All right, well, with all that serious legality stuff out of the way, all I have to do is do the visuals and the flavor text for the Celebi event on both the in-game side and the uh, e-card side, and Celebi's 100% done. Uh, here's how the event looks. Uh, I applied it to a cut tree in Petalburg Woods, and the game asks if you'd like to investigate. If you do, you get into a battle. If you don't, maybe another time. In addition, if you fail to capture the Celebi, it will say, the Celebi flew away. 
which is the strange message they gave to every encounter if you fail to catch them in these games. I don't really know why. Uh, these events are cool, but how am I getting them into the game? I'll be using these fully custom designed and printed cards that I made to get the true e-reader experience. I've printed dot codes before in my Reggie decoration present video, but that was just a blank dot code on a piece of paper. Nothing as complex as this. I designed everything in GIMP using my lackluster photo editing skills, and I based the front of the card off of the Pokedex, similar to how the berry card mimics the in-game berry tags. I included the Pokemon's front sprite and some info from the Pokedex about what hold item they'd have. And in the Pokedex section, I opted to put some story context for why each Pokemon would be in Hoenn. The shiny Celebi is just to denote that it can potentially be shiny, not that it will always be shiny. I wanted to differentiate the two cards in a way that would not be super jarring. For the back, I decided every card would have a unique one. Based sort of on what the Eon Ticket did, I've got each mod in a silhouette using the Sugimori art, and I included the logos for which game the card works on. Lastly, I just put a picture of the map you can find the Pokémon on there to fill out the rest of the space. Lining everything up properly was a huge pain, but I used a ruler and Google Docs to get proper measurements. I'd first print the dot code on one side of the paper using Ned C print, then I'd print the front on the same side, carefully lining it up in Google Docs to make sure that the front covered none of the dot code. Then I printed the back on the other half of the paper. I would then use a craft knife and a ruler to line everything up, and I combined them with wood glue and a sponge paintbrush. I think these came out pretty well, and if you would like to own your own set of these, comment down below. Everyone who comments I love the Nintendo e-reader will be entered for a chance to win a set of these, and channel members at the time of drawing will have their name entered three times to win a set. So if you want an extra chance, consider becoming a channel member. It costs as low as $1.99, you get access to a bunch of behind-the-scenes content, and you get access to all of my VODs and a bunch of emoji that you could use in my streams. And I stream pretty much five days a week right here on YouTube. If you want to make or print your own cards, everything I used will be in a GitHub repo in the description down below and in a pinned comment. So feel free to edit my events, get creative with it, or just use the files I provide to make everything yourself. Let's say you're interested in these events, but you don't have a printer or the e-reader or either one of them. What can you do to get these events? Well, I'll cut to the chase and be brief. You have three easy options if you want these events in your game. The first is getting your Game Boy Advanced game, save, and an e-reader ROM on your computer, and then using an emulator to do the transfer. I used MGBA for this during all of my debugging, and it's very easy to do. The second way is if you have a flash cart, you can load an e-reader ROM onto it, and then I'll provide e-reader saves in the GitHub that have these events stored in the access save data section of them, and you just use a link cable to transfer them that way. Alternatively, if you own an e-reader but not a printer, you can restore this save to an actual e-reader and that will work as well. The last method is using Suloku's Mystery Event 3 tool. You can directly inject the mystery event files I provide in the GitHub as well. This doesn't give you the fun swiping or seeing anything on the e-reader side, but it's no fuss way to get this into your game. And that's how I added brand new content, downloadable content some would say, to Pokemon Ruby and Sapphire. I think this elevates them to be closer to what Emerald and Fire Red and Leaf Green have to offer, and if you think so, let me know down in the comments. I was thinking about maybe doing the Legendary Coliseum Beasts, as well as Channel Jirachi, so if you're interested in that as well, let me know. I think I can get them done. I also want to give a very special shout out to Xiao, Riley, Gopier, Undead Reality, Happy Lappy, Militia, and Sleipnir for helping me with this project. I could not have done it without any of their help. Thanks everybody for watching. I hope you enjoy these events, and I'll see you next time.